Timothy, thank you. <laughs> I think we work through your entire repertoire there. Please be seated. Oh, you double-dipped, didn't you? Oh, yeah. It's all about it. Well, that's right. You didn't down there you were already there.
We have a remarkable capacity for moral imagination. And one of the things that we can do with that moral imagination is apply it to those in need. It's that moral imagination that allows us to summon what it must feel like not to be well physically, emotionally. Of course, if we've had the experience of not feeling well physically, emotionally, spiritually, then we uh, have some built-in empathy. But let's just say for a second we haven't suffered a particular concern. We can still summon this powerful imagination that we possess, this moral imagination, and summon things like Rahmanu, compassion, Hesed, grace, Ahava, love, Bina, discernment, think all these virtues, and put them together into positive action. And uh, it comes out in part in the Shebera, it comes out in part in Port Walim, visiting people, who aren't feeling well, and so on. So we're going to practice Bishop Eirach, and uh, we're going to do so on behalf of the following. Noreen Albert, Tanya Barlians, David Burchett, Faye Asora Bakhaya, Olivia Dunmars, Lana Fields, Don Rodolfo, Werner Hyman, Jane Heron, Larry Heyman, Priscilla Hill, Harold Katz, Molly Klee, Robert Langfelder, Janine Love, Stephen Martinez, Gerald Marks, Richard MacArthur, <coughs> Lloyd McClure, Stephen Melnick, Deborah Miller, Jimmy Miller, Scott Montgomery, Joseph Mosciano, Nicole Newcomb, Don Olson, Mark Perlman, Marion Prell, Alan Saber, <coughs> Leah Batsera, David Shepherd, Kristen Rouse Skinner, Maria Skalinskaya, Helen P. Saraparu, Linda Stahl, Tommy Stein, Kirk Stokes, Xavier Trobes, Susan Drynock Leader, Virginia Wharton, Sudratana Vasavi, Nahum Feibel, Ben Gadalia, Masha. Now, we began an experiment last night with many of you to uh, reach out to. Uh, I know that uh, some of you have a uh, number of people for whom you're saying Mishabera. So, 
in the interest of uh, timing and flow, I'm going to do the sweep here. I will not be able to make eye contact with every one of you. Okay? That should not dissuade you from mentioning the people you would like to mention. Just mention them out loud. If you need to mention the list beyond my ability to connect with you, that's okay too. All right? So we'll start from here. disaster of uh, Hurricane Dorian and other natural disasters that have us really people throughout the planet not well. Page 245. Was this truly a nisayon, a, a test 
a divine test of Abraham's faith. Perhaps an opportunity to prove to God his ultimate devotion. Many think so, but I don't. Not in the same way, anyway. I myself begin this query with the 14th century wisdom, Rabbeinu Nisim from Spain. The nature of this trial calls for further explanation, since there is no doubt that the Holy One does not test a person in order to prove to God whether he is capable or she is capable of withstanding the trial. So then, if this Nisayon is not a test of Abraham's unconditional faith and devotion, then what is it? And what do the results of this test tell us about our own human nature? Abraham is an ish tzaddik, a righteous person, an extraordinary man. And in his own head, he understands this. How could he not? One sage asks. He's healthy, wealthy, and wise. And while far from perfect, life's been good to Abraham so far. So good that contemporary commentator and one of my favorite teachers, Rabbi Bradley Artson, wonders whether with so many gifts from God, can Abraham ever be sure that his love for the Holy One is not just a reasonable response to self-interest? And personal reward. And so comes the real Nisayo, the true test. God knows Abraham very well. God knows Abraham is smart, thoughtful, and brave, a talented person willing to take risks to grow spiritually. God knows Abraham is a man of principle and that he loves his family. God also knows this. God knows the acute inner fog that possesses Abraham, a man consumed on the inside with doing the right thing, but saddled with doubts and inconsistencies on how actually to do the right thing. God thinks Abraham is too trapped in his head, too tangled in his feelings, too caught in words to get anything done. And to especially discover whether or not he really loves God without thought of reward. In other words, it's not the ideals we espouse that matter so much, nor the number of times we preach them, nor how deeply we feel them in our kishkas, it's what we do with our ideals that matters most. The reward is not in the love one receives from God for doing masim tovim, for doing good deeds. The reward is in doing the masim tovim in the first place because it's the right thing to do. Covering the reward is in just being a mensch. The reward is in just being a force for good. Why? Because it's the right way to be. It's the right way to act. In a more modern tale, Rabbi Artson adds this. God tests Abraham to show Abraham that the ideal of one loving God isn't worth very much unless we translate that love into practice. Unless we have loved ones in whom we can cultivate God's image. In requesting that Abraham sacrifice for the sake of God. In requesting that Abraham sacrifice Isaac for the sake of God. God hopes to move Abraham out of his ruminations and toward the realization of how precious his child and every human being is.
The Akita reminds us that we are so much more than potential. We can do better than we ever expected. But like Abraham learns in his test, Rosh Hashanah reminds us that we must prepare ourselves to convert our potential into kinetic moral force. We must turn our aspirations into actions. We must transform our Meshachite into Ma'asim Tovim, into good deeds. So, if it is our conviction that because we were once strangers in the land of Egypt, and we too know the heart of a stranger, then we must act in a welcoming and compassionate way. And if it is our belief that we are created Elohim in God's image and full of intrinsic worth, then we must act in an inclusive and respectful way. And if it is our priority to practice tikkun olam, to heal the world, then we must do our part to mend what is broken. As the children of Abraham and Sarah, we've been instructed to keep God's ways, to do what is just, to do what is right. For 140 years, Emmanuel Congregation has shaped a fine and enduring legacy of doing what is just and right. Let us continue then to practice justice and righteousness. The, two, the true test of our faith is how willing we are to act. On one hand, my call this morning is to each of us as individuals who must take initiative if our collaboration is to gain any new momentum. But our mission really imagines a practice of tikkun olam that summons us together to our shared strength as a collective force for good. All of us are stronger than one of us. We will best achieve our mission through a commonly constructed vision of a better world ensuing in cooperative engagement to realize this vision and perhaps most importantly the shared sacrifices necessary to make it all real. May it be God's will. So, P.S. I'm delighted to call up the captain of our Tikkun Olam team, Laurel Crown, for a specific call to action. Uh, Laurel and to our entire Tikkun Olam team, I'm most grateful for your work and your leadership, your service to our community. Kola Kavod, you have all my respect and uh, look forward uh, to your words, Laurel. And uh, again, Shana Tova, Mituka, Tumano. Yet we were a family that took seriously the Talmudic story.
story where Hillel teaches a stranger the entire Torah by saying, be good, the rest is commentary. Being good mattered to our family, but we didn't put a lot of energy into the commentary. To be honest, this hasn't changed that much for me in my adulthood, although I have spent a little more time studying the commentary. But still, when I do participate in Jewish ritual, it is the lessons that connect Judaism to social justice, to how and why we must be good that speak to me most. The lessons that Rabbi Morantz just mentioned, B'Tzalem Elohim, welcoming the stranger, and Tikkun Olam. I still don't go to Shabbat services very often, but I happened to be there this past Friday night. During the Amidah, I read this passage that has always spoken to me. Disturb us, Adonai. Ruffle us from our complacency. Make us dissatisfied. Dissatisfied with the peace of ignorance, the quietude which arises from a shunning of the horror, the defeat, the bitterness, and the poverty, physical and spiritual, of humans. Disturb us, O God, and vex us. Let not your Shabbat be a day of torpor and slumber. Let it be a time to be stirred and spurred to action. I love this passage. This notion of Shabbat as prayer, as a time to be awoken to and disturbed by all that is broken in this world. And there is so much broken in this world. I love thinking about prayer, not simply as contemplation and rumination, but rather as something that motivates us and prompts us to action. In preparing for this talk today, Rabbi Marantz and I discussed how we can take the lessons from the Akedah to deepen and expand Emmanuel's efforts around Tikkun Olam. Emmanuel already is, in many ways, engaged in Tikkun Olam. From collecting and delivering food to those in need, to our lobby collection boxes, to studying topics of relevance through Tikkun, uh, topics of relevance to Tikkun Olam, uh, through the Tikkun Olam book club, to our team members' engagement in the Latakin program, the social justice program that takes them to Washington, D.C. I'm proud of the work that we're doing, but there's more we can do, more I would argue we need to be doing. We know that this community is committed to social justice. When people join Emmanuel, Tikkun Olam is the most common topic people indicate they're interested in. And we are regularly approached by members asking how they can get involved in Tikkun Olam here. The commitment is there. The Akida teaches us that we need to turn our convictions into action. How can we work to make Emmanuel a place from which we turn our convictions into action? Almost two years ago, Emmanuel leaders signed on to the Brit Olam, the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism's covenant to create a world in which all people experience wholeness, justice, and compassion. Since then, we've spent a lot of time talking and thinking about what being part of the Brit might mean for Emmanuel, and more generally, what Tikkun Olam can look like in Emmanuel. But in all honesty, I don't think we've done as much as we can to engage the broader Emmanuel community in this conversation. And I don't think we've done as much as we can to act on the potential of the Brit Olam. The RAC has identified five key Brit Olam cohorts, immigration justice, gun violence prevention, environmental justice, racial justice, and reproductive justice. Engaging more deeply as a community in the Brit Olam, I think, is an important step toward turning our convictions into action. There's another line in the Amidah passage I read on Friday night that spoke to me as I thought about what I wanted to say today. Make us know that the borders of the sanctuary is not the border of living, and the walls of your temples are not shelters from the winds of truth, justice, and reality. When I read this line on Friday evening, I thought about this sanctuary, this Emmanuel community, filled with individuals who I know are disturbed by the pain, the suffering, the injustice they see in the world, and who want to do good, regardless of how much time they spend on the commentary. And I thought about how much more powerful we can be, how much more change we can affect when we take our commitment to be good outside the walls of this temple and in community. So I will end with this call to action, with an invitation to all of us to first consider our own personal grief, our own covenants to Tikkun Olam, to consider for ourselves what it means to be for a, what it means to be a force for good, and what we are willing to do to turn our values into action. But this is also a call to action for us as the Emmanuel community, an invitation to learn together, plan together, act together 
to continue to build Emmanuel as a place where our Jewish values are transformed into actions that bring wholeness, justice, and compassion to our world. Mishanah Tamah. Continue to work with you to uh, build this sort of inside out course of action. And, uh, stay tuned. Oh, and I can't resist the world. No, uh, this is for everybody. Um, <clears throat> on Shabbat, the light is always on, the door is always open. The invitation is eternal. Come by anytime you feel like it. We look forward to welcoming you.
verse 5 and following. And to Hannah, he would give a special portion because he loved Hannah and the eternal had closed her womb. And her rival wife would taunt her cruelly to make her tremble with grief, for the eternal had closed her womb. And so it was year after year, when she would go up to the house of the eternal, she taunted her. And Hannah would cry and not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you cry and why do you not eat? And why are you disheartened? Am I not worth more to you than ten sons? And Hannah rose and took eating and drinking a child, while Eli the priest sat upon the throne near the doorpost of the temple of the Eternal. And she, bitter to the core, prayed to the Eternal, weeping and crying. And she vowed and said, Eternal of heaven's hosts, if you will truly see your servant's affliction, and remember me, and not forget your servant, and give your servant a son, I will give him to the Eternal all the days of his life, and no razor should be lifted to his head. And as her praying before the internal intensified, Eli watched her mouth. And Hannah, she was speaking only in her heart. Though her lips were moving, her voice could not be heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. And Eli said to her, How long will you persist in drunkenness? Put away your wine, get rid of it. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, a woman of sorrow am I. I drank neither wine nor spirits, but poured out my soul before the eternal. Do not take your servant for a worthless woman. All this time I have spoken from the depth of my anger and from the greatness of my grievance. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, Sur kol ha'olamim, Sadiq b'chol ha'orot, Ha'adam ha'nehemalem, Ha'omer v'yaseh, Ha'mdaber v'chayim, Shekol devara alamem v'atzedeh, Al ha'torah, Ve'al ha'avodah, Ve'al ha'nevidim, Ve'al yom ha'zikaron ha'zeh, Shenatata lanu, Adonai Eloheinu, L'chavod t'ifaret,
that we can learn from these portions is that both the noise and silence are equally important in our tradition. We are a 140-year-old congregation that is built to last, but sometimes, lately, it's a little too quiet in this building. Look, I'm not extrapolating a Jewish view of noise, a love of noise from one Torah portion. We're a loud culture. Our history, our lives are filled with study halls, learning and arguing, laughing, music and dancing, storytelling, and so much more. In this context, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my summer experience. This summer, I went on a week-long trip to Poland as a member of an international Jewish delegation who was there to learn about Jewish life in Poland. We were not just there to understand the horrors of the Holocaust, but the thousand years of Jewish life in Poland before the Shoah and the 70 years of Jewish life since the camps were liberated. The most surprising part of the trip for us was meeting the Jews who still live in Poland, people who survived and returned to Warsaw as early as 1946. People raised in the Jewish communities in, in Krakow in the 1960s. But then Poland faced a silence under communism, and parents started to hide their heritage from their children for safety. Everyone we met spoke about the silence. I met Betty Pugh. She grew up Jewish. She knew she and her mother were Jewish. But she didn't know there were any other Jews in Poland because of the silence. Today, she organizes an alternative Jewish festival in Krakow. I met Kat Koreski. In her 20s, she kept asking her mother and her grandmother if they were Jewish. She just had a hunch. When they denied it, Kat had converted to Judaism. After her grandmother died, her mother told her the truth. They were Jewish but her mom kept her grandmother's secret because of the silence. Kotka is the author of two books about the modern Jewish experience in Poland. I met Andre, who grew up Catholic, and then took a 23 and DNA test, which told a new family story. <laughs> he and his mother had begun a, began a path to discover their roots, though his brother was not interested in joining them on the journey. But they didn't know their family history because of the silence. Krakow and Warsaw are home to JCCs for everyone, along with the JDC and the Jewish community, which is their version of the Federation. There are Jewish day schools like Lauer and Drasha for children. There's Birthright Israel and Hillel for college students. In Poland, these Jewish institutions serve as a place where our Jewish brothers and sisters can discover or remember what it means to be Jewish and how to be Jewish. These institutions are vital to overcoming a generation of silence and are making noise. At Rowdy Shabbat dinners in Krakow, a kosher Sunday brunch in Warsaw that rivals anything in Wicker Park, and welcoming every stranger who comes to discover their Polish and Jewish roots. I'm telling you about the shift from silence to noise in Poland because I believe that Jewish institutions are as important in Chicago as they are in Poland. I believe that a synagogue can be a place where people of all ages learn how to live Jewishly, ethically, and where we educate our community's children. We must embrace both the positive, joyful noise and the meaningful silence of prayer and meditation that comes from being a central location for Jewish life imbued with meaning and community, silence and noise. I know that as a Gen Xer, I'm not supposed to think um, that, like, I'm not supposed to love synagogues or be too into brick and mortar stuff. But I love a manual congregation. I love this building and I love the people in it. We need physical gathering spacer, spaces where we can learn together and then take that into our hearts and make for richer, more meaningful lives and to make some noise. We must continue to extend our understanding of the synagogue to include, once again, being a center where people come to laugh, to learn, to experience something new or different. 
to leave our holy building slightly transformed, visit by visit, just as people in Krakow are transformed with every visit to the JCC. As president of the congregation, this is where I shift gears and make a pitch. I have two pitches. The first is a traditional sort, a pitch for pledges. In the engagement brochure, um, which is back for its second year, thanks to the hard work of our office, um, this is your guide to everything going on in a manual. So whether it's your first time here or you're a third generation member, I think you'll find this engagement brochure has a lot of great information and a lot of doors for you to walk through. It also has um, a pledge envelope. I'm asking you to think about the importance of this Jewish institution in your life and ask that if you can afford to give above your dues, that you make a commitment to our community. We are here because of the leadership and community giving of generations before us. And I look to this room to sustain our congregation for generations to come. My second pitch is an invitation that you help us create meaningful silence and joyful noise. Many of us want to fill these walls and transform this into a place that you want to visit more often, to transform your, yourself bit by bit. And to do that, we need ideas and volunteers. We are looking for ideas for events. They might be open mics, storytellers, meditations, concerts, classes that convey our ethics to the world. We want to educate, engage, and entertain all of Chicago and make our community a bit larger and more encompassing. We want to introduce more people to our tradition of being open and caring. Uh, but we also have so many great things happening already and volunteer opportunities are waiting for you. Uh, like we've mentioned, this is our 140th year. You may have noticed a special logo showing up on Collabo this year. Um, uh, the weekend of October 19th and 20th, we'll kick off our 140th celebration by participating in Open House Chicago. We're hosting a storytelling event called People Who Usually Don't Lecture that includes the Betty Congo from MTV and our bunch of alert, along with seven other speakers. Um, that's also the weekend of Simchat Torah and Consecration. In March, we will celebrate Legacy Weekend, and we're currently building the committee. You could join the membership committee. This is a group dedicated to recruiting and retaining members, with experiments like making name tags more readily available during services, during services and events as part of Audacious Hospitality. If you're in your 20s and 30s, you can join EDGE and plan the events you want to attend not the events I think you want to attend. <laughs> if you like breakfast, who likes breakfast? Who like breakfast? You can volunteer on Sunday mornings in the cafe, which is a fundraiser to provide camp scholarships. So you get the idea. Please find me. Text me, tweet me, Facebook, whatever. Tell me what you'd love to see, what you would love to see here, and how you can help us do it. Join me in bringing the noise back to a manual congregation. Shana Tova, have a good year. May it each be inscribed in the Book of Life. Leah, I'd just like to say that uh, not only are you a worthy Darshanic, uh, a worthy interpreter of Torah, but you are uh, an amazing leader of an esteemed Jewish community. I'm very proud of your influence and the influence of uh, the Board of Trustees that serves along with you. And uh, what I appreciate most about you, Leah, I've shared with you, I want to share with everyone else. I am a great admirer of Leah's intellectual capacity and understands how a legacy institution can grow faster on its feet and fresher and more outward facing. And to see that its longevity is not only in appreciating a 140-year legacy, but in building on it and bringing it out to the bigger world. And so, uh, Leah, you brought us a global perspective today, and I think Emmanuel will serve itself well if we are more global 
in our thinking. With you at the helm, I think we're in fabulous shape. So thank you and call it Page 286, we invite you to rise either physically or spiritually through the elite. On the name of the sharp arrow, on the dawn of the heart of all, let the take love and separation. Shall you let the shine of yourself on earth? Who must have a lake of road wash in my mind? In the spirit of the creativity of this day, we turn our hearts to those whose legacies we remember, reflect the creativity of their spirits, the lessons they taught, the legacies they shaped, and we also bear witness to the fact that our capacity to remember is powerful act of creativity in itself, because with it we can continue to uh, remember that life and loss matter and we will stay steadfast in our commitment to making both real. In that spirit, <coughs> we think of the following who died recently, Lorna Weber Sherry, Richard Calvo, and all those who perished in Hurricane Dorian and elsewhere via natural disasters. In addition, we observe the following our sighting, Dorothy Abrams Arender, Hannah Aronson, Stella Brenner, Louis Kahn, uh, Stuart Blankstein, Raymond Shades, George D. Danford, William Edelstein, Sophie Ehrlich, Patricia Estes, Saul R. Fellers, Sandra Goldberger, Joel Joseph Goodman, Robert Goodman Golden, Simon William Hurwich, Dustin Jacobson, Selma Cantor, Marion Kleinberg, Carl Krauss, Jack Malavani, Nancy Martin, Bernice D. Minkus, Kate Minkus, Molly Oyring, George Wadalski, Emil J. Pollock, Cheryl Rosenbaum, Hart Liam Sangerman, Diane Schatz, Thea Shulkin, Jerome Solomon, William Tellisman, Shirley Tellisman Kresh, Edna Zuckerman. In addition, corrections, repronunciations will start, and I'll sweep my hand just to mention names.
Sri Kronama the Khan, in memory of the peace of your soul, speak for a blessing, invite your lives, and body, and or spirit, or as is your custom, and we'll pray in Kaddish. Let us cast away the sin of vain ambition 
to drive, that drives us to strive for empty goals. Let us cast away the sin of stubbornness that hinders our ability to change for the better. Let us cast away the sin of envy that consumes us with desire and clouds our ability to see the treasures we already have. Let us cast away the sin of selfishness that keeps us from sharing with and connecting with our fellow human beings. Let us cast away the sin of indifference that makes us insensitive to those we love and the needs of others. Let us cast away the sin of pride and arrogance so that we may return to God in humility and reverence. <laughs> You will hurl out your sins into the depth of the seas. You reminded us to preserve the faith of our ancestors, to remain loyal in the ways of our mothers and fathers, and in returning to God, to renew the covenant as in days gone by. Who is like you, O God, forgiving our sins and pardoning our transgressions? You show us faithfulness and bestow upon us your loving kindness, renewing the promise you made to our ancestors in days of old. Today we begin a new year of goodness. Today, with these crumbs, we are throwing away all the things that might spoil our new year. May all our bad habits. May all our bad habits. And the grudges we have held. And all the grudges we have held. And all the things we have done. And all the things we have done. Be wrong. thrown away. Be thrown away. And never come and back. And never come back. Good and sweet to my ears, one and all. Let's go cast out some red rum. 